Words are powerful. If there's one thing I want you to leave with an understanding of today, it's the power of words. And uh, today, I'll be really just introducing, um, knowing that our time's a little bit shorter this morning, I'm just going to be introducing where we're going to be going for a number of weeks, an indeterminate number of weeks at this point, uh, rather than just nailing it down saying we're going to do three of this or four of this or six of this. I'll share the direction as, as I get more into the introduction, but today is going to be a little bit different than usual from, in that I just want to kind of set the stage for where we're going to be going uh, for February and March and with the exception, well, even East, possibly into April. And those of you who are here for the series on the book of John know this could go four and a half years. So we're going to go as far as we, we can, but I, I just want to establish a foundation and a direction as the Lord has spoken to my heart about words and their power, and he's spoken to me through his word. Our text is taken from Hebrews chapter 1 a moment ago. My heart kind of took a jump when Pastor Dan took us to uh, this word, God. Chapter 1, Hebrews, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. Spoke, has spoken. Once again, the text, God who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God spoke. Early this morning, I caught a guest on a radio talk show. I heard her saying, I believe in God. I'm a religious person. Well, she said, I'm really not so much a religious person, I'm a spiritual person. My ears perked up. I thought that was really intriguing. She wasn't religious, but she, was, she saw herself as being spiritual. And she went on to declare her love for this beautiful world and our spiritual connection to one another. She had absolutely no basis for anything that she was, that she was putting out there, but she was, a, she was a spiritual person and was sure that we were all corrected and I found myself talking to the radio. Do you ever do that? Talking back to the radio. I'm, I'm driving down the road, still dark, driving down the road, and I'm, I'm wanting to just slam my fist on the dashboard and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God has spoken. You don't have to kind of touchy-feely your way to, maybe this is what spirituality is all about, and I feel kind of connected to my brother or to my sister, or I, I feel like maybe I'm having kind of a, a religious experience as I, I, I interact with nature, and that's kind of where I find my own God. We don't have to go down those roads. We don't have to settle for, it's not even second best, we don't have to settle for a fraud. God has spoken. He's spoken to us. So I'm screaming at the radio, God has spoken. In various ways, various times, to the fathers by the prophets in these last days, by his own son. God speaks by his word and through his works and by his spirit in the hearts of his people. God has spoken. God speaks. Read the Genesis record and you can't miss it. Every few verses, you come upon these three words. Note them. The next time you read Genesis 1, note them. Then God said. Then God said, over and over again, God said, and as God spoke, things came into being. He spoke the world into existence. From Genesis, we jump to John chapter 1, and John 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 1 have a, a remarkable similarity to them. John starts out and he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created with him by, the or by him. By the time we get to the third verse, it's clear that he's focused on Jesus being the Word of God. And he says, all things were made through him and nothing without him, nothing was made that was made. Nothing was made that was made without him. It was all spoken into existence. God spoke. You know, he could have made us creatures of instinct. Some of you have creatures of instinct in your house. You can train a creature. I'm talking about cats who can be semi-trained. Dogs were much better with dogs. Sheep, you cannot train a sheep. And isn't it interesting that we are always noted to be the sheep of his pasture? Just something to think about. But most animals have certain instincts, and you can train their instincts, and before long we, be, we begin to believe, and I'll get in trouble here, we, believe, we begin to believe that those animals have souls. 
I just look into the dog, I just look into the face of, of that pug and I just know, I know there's a soul in there. Just such a beautiful dog and such a wonderful spirit. And Well, we don't have any evidence whatsoever that dogs have, as a matter of fact, I can argue the ac absolute opposite. Animals are given instincts and they're created by God and, and there's a, a direction that they'll take and we can train them to a certain level, but God could have made us like that. Would, don't you at times wish that he'd just given you an instinct for righteousness? Wouldn't that have been great? If God just made you righteous, habitually righteous, wouldn't that have been awesome? And, and it seems, as I may have misunderstand the scripture, but it seems that he did, and then sin entered the picture and corrupted the whole thing. But we have then a bent after the fall of Adam, we have a bent towards evil. We have a completely different outlook in life, and we follow a completely different path. But he could have made us with an intuition, like animals who follow the migratory rhythms of the earth. But then we would not have been made in his image. We would not have been God's people. We would have been God's pets. And God didn't want pets. He wanted a people. He wanted fellowship with us. He wanted relationship with us. He made us as the crown of his creation. He made us eternal. He made us different than all of the rest of creation. He made us for fellowship. He made us conversant. He gave us the grace of language so that we might answer him. He still speaks. He gave us the grace of language to talk to him. Words are powerful. Among the wonders of creation, what human faculty can rival the wonder of speech? A comprehension. The wonder of conversation. The medium of words. See, as I introduce where we're going to be going, I, I want us as a congregation to really grasp the, the power and the wonder and the grace and the glory of words. I know we all have that sense of, of the holiness and the purity and the power and the wonder of the word, but we, can we just back up for a moment and understand what grace God has given us in giving us a language and a means of communicating with one another? It's an awesome thing. Words are powerful. They inspire our greatest endeavors. They incite our darkest evils. They can mean everything or they can mean absolutely nothing. I wonder what the percentage, the material that we see on television in the run of a week, I wonder what percentage of that material has absolutely no meaning whatsoever in our lives and yet it's just... It's constantly flowing and we're being communicated with and shouted at and talked to in almost every arena of life. Either the iPad or the iPhone or the computer or the email, the telephone, it doesn't matter what it is. Wherever we go, we've got information coming at us and some of it is so very valuable and some of it is so incredibly trivial and it's all words, but they have such potential for good and for greatness and, well, such potential for destruction. Words can unravel mysteries, and words can be captured in utter nonsense. They can kindle, words can kindle passions, and they can extinguish them just as quickly. Many of you, many of you are married because he said the right thing or she said the right thing, and if they had said the wrong thing at the wrong time, you wouldn't be married today. Some enchanted evening. You saw him or her across the room and the right words were said at the right times for so many people. It's, it really came down to, it all started with communication. Words. Well, we talked and then, well, it just seemed like we could talk all day. We talked all night. What's that all about? Well, words are powerful. They can kindle these passions within us. How many of you have ever completely scuttled a relationship with just a few words? You can destroy a relationship with words. Tell your mama she's ugly. You want to make a mess? Tell your mama. And I just looked down and Donnie's sitting here with his mother today. You're not. You're beautiful. You're lovely. I just realized I welcomed some moms here this morning. But if you tell your mother you're ugly or if you tell your wife, well, I won't even go there. Tell your children they're dumb. You can, you can absolutely destroy a relationship with words, can't you? 
You can destroy a child, you can destroy an adult. It's amazing, the destructive power of words. Words are, words are powerful. Life can turn on what I should have said or what I should not have said. Paul says our conversation should be gracious and seasoned with salt. The idea is that there should be some preparation before it escapes. James says, so my brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. We're not really good at that. I'm not really good at that. Be swift to hear, but be slow to speak. Ecclesiastes 5, Solomon writes, Don't be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Words are powerful. They should be measured. We should understand them. Say the right word, and you can heal or teach or touch. Say the wrong words. You can wound, you can crush, you can spurn. Say the right words, and you'll receive a warm welcome. You say the wrong words, and they might throw you out the door, throw you through the door. Depends on where you go and what you say. It all comes down to what comes out of our mouths. No discussion. No discussion of the power of language is complete until you've moved on from our words to his word. No discussion of the power of language is complete until you look at Jesus. Remember what they said of him? It was in John chapter 7. Here's what they said of him. No man ever spoke like this man. I've heard some pretty compelling people share some compelling stories I've watched people take, just last week, uh, I, I was in a, a meeting and Hulda Buntain, who is one of our veteran missionaries from India, she would be 85 plus now. No one can really nail her down on exactly where she is in that age scale. This saint of God who's been involved in the mission field all these years serving in, in India stepped up on this stage in front of these men, ministers and she held us absolutely spellbound for about seven to eight minutes. She had us. The moment she opened her, her mouth, she was, she was absolutely clear on what she was going to say. She was completely fluent and fluid in the way that she communicated. You could see she was building her case. She was walking us step by step. And I sat out there in utter amazement, I, at utter amazement at how incredibly sharp she was. She made me want to go to, she made me want to go to India. You could sense the passion in her heart, but in those moments, she got us. She got us with her command of language when she spoke. We had to listen to her. And sometimes you'll hear people, you'll hear people like that and say, they just make me want to listen. When Jesus spoke, the consensus was no one, no one spoke like this man ever spoke. When he spoke, his words burned. You'll remember that word from Luke on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was revealed to the disciples. Remember what they said after he shared the scripture with them and they broke bread? He said, didn't or they said, didn't our, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke and opened the scriptures to us? Jesus' economy with language is unparalleled. No one is, has even come close. The Sermon on the Mount is considered to be the ultimate expression of ethics. The ultimate expression of ethics, crossing all religious and philosophical lines. I was reading Harvey Cox, who has uh, written extensive, very liberal and secular uh, religious educator. He's, he's written on, on the subject of ethics, written volumes on the subject of ethics, and especially the ethics of Jesus. He's written volumes on the ethics of Jesus. I read Bonhoeffer's ethics. I waited, I waited and suffered through it, but I made it all the way through. It was a torturous journey, and it was a book about this thick, but I, I made it all the way through. I've read a, a lot on ethics. Uh, Ravi Zacharias and some of the modern uh, apologists are, are out there, and they're speaking to ethical issues, so I'm constantly reading on ethical issues, and the volume of material gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and yet Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, all of these philosophers generally are in agreement 
statement that no one ever seized upon the core of human ethics as he did. No one. No one ascended to the pinnacle of ethics. No one understood the ethical mind or the ethical heart like Jesus did. No one. And they speak of the Sermon uh, on the Mount with absolute reverence, even though they may be totally irreverent and secular people. The Sermon on the Mount absolutely amazes them because it crosses religious philosophical lines and creates an ethic for life that is unparalleled. And you can read the Sermon on the Mount. I tested it this week in five minutes. You could read every word that Jesus spoke in an hour. You can go over it and over it and over it. If you want to take a day, you can really, you can really work your way through Sermon on the Mount. You can study it from all sides and, and aspects, and it will just stir more conversation and more thoughts. That's why we write so much about the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus, in something that can be read in our day in five minutes, took what they've tried to say in all of these volumes and he spoke it to the heart in such a way and he spoke with such clarity and with such completeness that philosophers marvel still. There is absolutely nothing out there on the in the philosophical marketplace that comes close to the simple ethic of the Sermon on the Mount or ethics of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus spoke his words, he, he spoke with complete authority. He spoke with absolute conviction. He spoke with perfect inerrancy. And he spoke with purity of motive. He was different than anyone who spoke ever before him. And he told the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And the truth makes men free. When it's rejected, it makes men miserable. But when it's accepted, when it's received, when it's internalized, the truth makes men free. Walk with Jesus through the Gospels and everywhere he went, his words, his words changed everything around him. He spoke and blind men saw and lame men walked and, and bad men found redemption and dead men breathed again. Because his word was life-giving. He could speak to the storms, and you know the storm would cease. He could speak to the learned, and the learned would fall silent in awe at his words. He would speak to the simple, and the simple would understand. He'd put it in a parable, he'd tell it in a story, and suddenly they would grasp something of the eternal that had escaped all of the academic wonder kids who have come before them. The simple peasant would understand something about God that the ancient philosopher had tried to somehow winnow out of the universe. He could speak to the fallen and they would find grace and dignity again. He would speak to, to broken hearts and broken minds and broken bodies, and they were healed. He could speak into Lazarus' cold grave, and even death had to answer him. Lazarus, come forth. And there was a sound in that tomb of feet shuffling. Lazarus, come forth. Even death had to answer when he spoke. You see, when he utters his voice, every force in heaven and on earth and in hell takes notice. When he finished his work, fulfilling the words of the prophets, he committed to us the word, his word. He put it in our hands, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20 says, He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. As though God were pleading through us. He has given us his word. And when we proclaim his word, that's why, that's why Dan is in, in Kenya working with, with young pastors and training them up. It's when they go out and they proclaim his word, something supernatural is going to happen. He's entrusted to us the word of God, and the word of God can change the world. It changes everything. God has chosen the, 
to use the imperfect medium of human speech as the primary means for redeeming his lost creation. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 21. This will be familiar to you. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God the world through, the, through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. Foolishness to those who don't believe. Through the foolishness, seeming foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Words are powerful. And when our words are the word of God, we're talking about unthinkable, immeasurable power. When Jesus told his disciples that he would be going to his Father, he told them, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. All things that I said to you. The first few times, and, and Dan was sharing a moment ago about hermeneutics. It, when I first started grappling with that whole text, my whole idea with that text was that, well, that's great. One of these days, you know, I'll be out there and I'll really be in a jam and God will just bring to me. He'll bring to my remembrance the things because he promised that he would do that by the Holy Ghost. And that you can take that as maybe a secondary application, but stop and think about where it was written, to whom it was written. Paul said he, he'll bring all things to your remembrance. Well, we had all, he said, Dan was sharing a moment ago that James was written first, and then, then we've got the Gospels that follow, and they follow in different order, and the epistles of Paul and everything else. This was the Holy Spirit at work bringing to their minds everything that Jesus had spoken. Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered how the Gospel could be so incredibly complete and so inc incredibly rich? Have you, ever, have you ever read it and said, how did they remember all of those things? Well, the Holy Spirit, and how could, how, could those, how could those apostles, how could they possibly have remembered everything they needed to remember that connected to the Old Testament and connected to the epistles that weren't even the, those in the Gospels? How could they know they needed that passage in there for it would connect so purely with the epistles? And How could all of these things work together? Because God was, by his Holy Spirit, bringing to their remembrance everything that Jesus had done. Everything that he'd done. Now, he will bring to your remembrance the word of God as you study it, you eternalize it. The spirit is always at work bringing the word to our minds that we might reveal Jesus to the world. But understand, this is why we have a Bible today. We have the Bible today because the Holy Spirit brought to their remembrance the very words that Jesus spoke. We have the word of God. There's nothing that compares to the Word. And I chose to bring this, this Bible on purpose. My father, just after I got saved, my dad and my mom, it's 1976, they, they gave me this Bible for Christmas. It's a Schofield reference edition. Uh, it's got my name on it. Isn't that nice? What's precious to me is that first they gave me this Bible. It was, I re I'd had Bibles before, but it meant so much to me as a as you know, a change had really taken place in my life, and I was getting ready, preparing for Bible college, and they gave me this Bible, but my dad, it's what they wrote in the flyleaf of the Bible that has been so powerful for me after all these years. My dad wrote these words. I later found the quote in, um, in one of E. Stanley Jones' books on the Sermon on the Mount, and dad said, he paraphrased it, but he quoted E. Stanley Jones when he said, you'll need nothing quite so much in the days ahead as a working philosophy of life, an adequate way to live, this gift will give you both. A working philosophy of life, an adequate way to live. We have all of that and more because of words, because of the word. All I can say is that dad was right. It's given me both of those things. It's given me a working philosophy of life. It's given me a sure foundation. 
It's given me an adequate way to live, an understanding of what life can be and what it can look like. I've received all of that and so much more. Dad never gave me a gift in all of my life that could match the gift of God's Word. And no man has given me more than my dad. I love the Word of God. I'm amazed at His Word. Every Tuesday morning, I sit right there, 6.30 in the morning at that's my prayer time. I've got 6 or 8 or 12. You're welcome to come. Just understand the rules. Okay? This is my prayer time. 6.30, you're all welcome. And I've got a crew that come, and I'd love to have you join us, but just understand the rules. From 6.30 for 45 minutes, that's your time. Find a place. That's your time with your Bible open and your heart out. Your, your, your heart, you can pray the whole time, you can study the scripture, but that's your time. We'll have 15 minutes where we'll gather together at the end of that, but for almost 20 years now here at Calvary Church, every Tuesday morning of my life at 6.30 has been time with my Bible. And it was just kind of something that we started to do to draw people together for prayer a long, long time ago. But for me, that has become my anchor point during the week. Whatever happens within this church, generally it starts or it has its origins in a Tuesday morning sitting in the third row, second seat in, because I need a place to put all my stuff. But that's my spot. And I sit there with God's word and I pray over where we're going as a church and what he would have me share. And sometimes I'm in series and so I'm looking at the passages that we're going to be working through in a series of messages and sometimes I'm saying, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me and what do you want to say to the church this week through me? And, and I'm looking for direction from the Lord, but everything comes down for me to that Tuesday morning at 6.30, that time that I spend with the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me. Let me tell you this. If you will, if you will study the scripture and if you will pray, Lord, speak to me by your word. The word will speak to you. It doesn't matter what circumstance or situation you are dealing with in life. If you will give yourself to the Lord in prayer, open your Bible and begin to work your way through its pages and say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to my circumstance. Speak to my need. Speak to my brokenness. Speak to my rebellion. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me by your word. He will speak to you by his word. He is still speaking by his word. I'm amazed at his word. I'm convinced by his word. I'm, I'm saved and healed. I'm redeemed by his word. I'm directed and I'm corrected by his word. I need his word. In a world that's awash in empty words, I hunger for truth, for God's word. It's the greatest need of the world. It's the greatest need of the world. It's the answer to life's greatest questions. It's the authority that stands, that endures when all other authorities have fallen. It's infallible. It's unchanging. It's forever settled in heaven. It's eternal. From and to all ages, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. It's a little bit of the eternal. Do you realize when you're studying your Bible, when you're internalizing the Word of God, when you're, when you're meditating on these things, do you realize that you are literally, you are touching something that is eternal? You had no idea, did you? You're going to want to rush home. You say, I, I want to touch something that is miraculous. I want to touch something that is powerful. I, touch your Bible. Open it up and begin to just let it speak to you because you are, you are touching, you are touching on that which is eternal. It will outlast heaven and earth as we know it, as we know it in the scripture, as we know it today. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. All of those things are going to burn up. They're going to be folded up. It's just, it's going to be obliterated. He's going to give us this whole new heaven and earth this, as I understand the, the scripture. And the one thing that remains forever and ever and ever is going to be what? His word. His word. So we need to be people who know his word, who love his word, who are constantly just chewing over the word of God. I love Eugene Peterson's take on, on uh, the, the scripture that speaks in the Hebrew of us meditating on the word of God. In that law doth he meditate day and night, you know, from Psalm 1-1. Uh, in, that, in that law he meditates day and night and and Peterson unpacks the meaning of that Hebrew word and, and the, the, the idea behind it is like a lion that is 
growling as it's gnawing on a bone. That's the idea of meditate. In that law, he meditates day and night. You and I, are, we're supposed to be gnawing like an animal that's working over a bone and working at the marrow, just gnawing away at that and working it over and over and over and over. That's meditating in his word. And when he, he gives us life through his word. When we Christians gather in his name, it is for the purpose described in his word. For the study of an inexhaustible resource. That's part of the reason that we're here this morning. Because words are powerful. But his words reflect his attributes. And his word is all powerful and eternal and everlasting. God's word speaks to everything, everywhere, every time. It was as I studied God's word about 10 days ago, I was suddenly taken by the power of God's word in its simplest phrases. And everything I've said this morning leads to this. This is what I've introduced. Most of you know my introductions are much longer than my points. And this morning I've taken all this time to set the stage, just trying to somehow establish this foundation that God's word is just amazing and unthinkable and unsearchable and mind-blowing and all-powerful because as I was meditating about 10 days ago, I was just spending some time in the Word of God. I had a passage that I had, had chosen and I was working it over. I was, I was chewing away and gnawing away at the bones of it and working on the structure of it. And I was studying the 11th chapter of Hebrews as it relates to the story of Abraham in Genesis 11. So I was between Hebrews 11 and and Genesis chapter 12. I've always been amazed at how God chose and how God spoke to Abram, who to the best of our knowledge had been raised in an idolatrous family. Somehow this man, who didn't seem to have the right background or pedigree, somehow this man heard God's voice And the scripture says he simply obeyed. I was smashed by that. It's the only way I can describe it. I was, I was, I've I've read the text a a hundred times in the 11th chapter of Hebrews verse 8 or even more. I've read it over and over again that by faith Abraham obeyed. That's all I, that's all I got. That was, I was, I was reading that passage and I was struck by it and I was actually, I was, I was stuck there. This is in the, he, uh, the um, Heroes of Faith, or the Hall of Faith passage in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out of the place, uh, all, to go out to the place from which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out, and the scripture says, he went out not knowing where he was going. And I was struck by the power of the first four words of the text. By faith Abraham obeyed. Four words. By faith Abraham obeyed. I was meditating on those words. Years ago, I heard an interview with the great, great preacher T.D. Jakes concerning his sermon preparation. I sat up and paid attention. He talked about how in his preparation, he starts with the book of the Bible, then he focuses in on the chapter and then on the paragraph and then on the sentence and then the phrase, and then he breaks it down to each word, gets into the language itself and breaks it down to each word. And as he was sharing that day, as only Jake's can with just such incredible eloquence, as he was sharing where sometimes he'll be prompted in the scripture, he'll be prompted with a a scripture to preach, and he knows already kind of what he feels like the message of the text is and where the sermon's going to go, but he is disciplined himself to sit down and to back up and say, okay, if I'm going to preach from Luke, then I need to get firmly fixed in my mind Luke as the book. What is the book? Who's the author? That He starts with the book. He looks then to the chapters of the section and then to the chapters, and from the chapters he goes to, to paragraphs as best he can discern how the paragraph should break out, and then he goes to the sentence and to the phrase, and he goes to the word. That's why Jake's at times preaches with such incredible power. He'll take two or three words and he'll turn a room absolutely upside down. It's because he's done his due diligence and he has mined the truth and the power of the word. And I've attempted the same discipline and I was doing just that. It was part of the discipline and sermon preparation for me. I was meditating on those four words. By faith, Abraham obeyed. And I I kind of sat back from the table and the scripture text was up on the iPad. 
And I was, I was rolling it over and over in my mind, amazed again by this man who was, as we understand it, a pagan idolater, heard the voice of God, discerned that this was, that this was truly God. And when God spoke to him, however God spoke to him, and said, get up out of this country, I'm going to take you to a land I'm going to give you as an inheritance, by faith, Abraham did that. We're not talking about a short journey. We're not talking about checking into the next neighborhood. We're talking about a man who, who uproots his family and he's, he's gone. In those days, it's almost the other, other side of the world. As a matter of fact, we can fly to the other side of the world faster than Abraham would have been able to get there. And he did it. By faith, Abraham obeyed. And so those words were going over and over in my mind. I was, just, I was just meditating on that, and, and it was like somebody turned on a faucet inside of me. It was a very strange experience. By faith, Abraham obeyed was followed by other four-word phrases in the Scripture that just suddenly came alive within me. I was, in a, I was in a little coffee shop, and there were a lot of people there, but suddenly I was all alone. It was just me and the Word of God, and I, it, it was like everything else was shut out, and I... I was focused by faith, Abraham obeyed, and then for God so loved. Boy, that says a lot, doesn't it? How about the Word became flesh? And this, it was happening about this fast, and then in the beginning, God. And they were, they were flowing one at these four-word phrases from the Scripture that were so awesome and so foundational and, and so powerful. I forgot all about Abraham, and four-word phrases just kept coming to mind. To live is Christ. Be anxious for nothing. I shall not want. My grace is sufficient. Well, now I began to type. And the Scripture began to roll like waves I am not ashamed. I am the way. For all have sinned. Four words. All things are possible. Is that powerful or what? All things are possible. Those of you who have drugged all of your impossibilities in here this morning, they're all illegitimate because in Christ all things are, well, you know. Four words. How about this one? I will come again. There's a sermon in that. Don't you think? And then there are powerful questions in the Scripture that four words. I don't know why it hit me this way. It just did. Whom shall I fear? Here's one maybe you need to ask. Why? Why are you angry? Do you love me? Genesis, has God indeed said, wow, does the enemy ever use that one, huh? Some were inspiring, like, be strong and courageous. God is our refuge. Some were devastating. Like, I never knew you. Have you ever read those words? Has it ever just rolled apart? From, I never knew you. Last night, the list had passed 60. 60 four-word texts that speak powerfully to the issues of life. Every one of these four-word phrases is like a gold mine because the words are so incredibly powerful and the Word of God is inexhaustible. Now, obviously, as we pull these phrases, as we take these four words, we're going to be pulling from their context and from the chapter and the verse and the whole scope of it all, but... In the coming weeks, it's my intention to take my texts from four words, and I believe it will be enough because words are powerful. And the Word of God, even in four words, is unthinkably powerful. You see, God has He's spoken to us. He's spoken to us. I often meet people in desperate places, in trouble, in loss, in need, in pain. 
They say often here in the altar, they say, Pastor, Pastor, I just, I need, a, I need to hear from God. Pastor, I need a word. Pastor, do you have a word for me? Some people run place to place if they hear there's something going on, some type of revival taking place, hoping that they can receive a word. I need a word. I'm going to this place. Maybe I'll get a word. And, and believe me, please understand me. Make no mistake, prophetic gifts are for today and God speaks to us with words of wisdom and words of knowledge and God will, God will speak exhortation. To, he'll use spiritual gifts to, to speak to us. We're there on that. But in most cases, he has already spoken and it's there for us if we'll search it, if we'll dig it out, if we'll listen to his word, even a phrase as short as four words. If we'll listen, he'll speak to us. We'll answer him. And the grace of a heavenly conversation will grow us up and make us strong and heal us if we will just listen to what he has already said. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. Would you stand with me? This I am convinced of this morning. There is absolutely nothing that is happening in the context of your life. Struggles, pain, hardship, heartache, don't know what to do, longing for something. Help me, God. There's nothing in your life that his word has not already spoken to. I'm going to ask our elders and their wives if they'd make themselves available in the altar should you need personal ministry today for any need, healing in your body, spiritual quest you're searching, we're here for you and we want to pray with you and for you. But I'm asking you as, as you're standing even now, I'm, I'm asking you to do this to do this one thing this week, would you? Would you take that stuff that you're dealing with? Would you take the need? Would you take the worry? Would you take the hurt? Would you take the pain? Would you take the anger? Would you take those things? Would you, would you take it with an open Bible and begin to search for what God has already spoken? How he has already spoken to you. He'll speak to you. He'll touch you. He'll make you whole. I'm going to pray, and that will serve as a committal and dismissal for us as we give ourselves to the Lord and for a week. And if you have needs, our elders have come this morning to pray with you. It doesn't matter what it is. We want to just share with you for a moment in prayer of agreement, regardless of what it is, you're welcome to come. Heavenly Father, we have heard your word many times of us have heard your word over and over again and yet we are absolutely beside ourselves with a sense of its wonder and its awe and I pray that in the coming weeks you would open this congregation like never before to the glory of your word and to the power of your word may the words that we speak O oh Lord may they be your words may we be guided by your Holy Spirit this week let the word of God rel dwell in us richly I pray we might be effective for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May God richly bless you. Our altars are open.